Um, but the reason I asked Alex to do this is he um, is, of course, an outstanding speaker, um, a fantastic scientist. He's one of my colleagues here. He's on a NIDA T32, a NIDA Neuroscience T32, and eagerly awaiting his KO1 funding. Um, Alex is a phenomenal methodologist, and he came to us from Naomi Friedman's lab in Boulder and really has been um, an asset to the many analyses that we do, including our asset analyses. Um, so Alex has for you a treat, I think. He's going to walk all of you through um, where you can go to search for genome-wide association studies, um, something that we do a lot in the Psychiatric Genomics Consortium that Alex and I are both a part of. Um, and once you've found them, and I think he's going to focus on substance use disorder and addiction-related phenotypes, um, but you can apply almost all of the same methodologies that Alex is going to show you today to any any trait of interest and please if you are interested in depression or psychosis or cognitive ability which is alex's forte as well um, please feel free to reach out to either of us and we can guide you to what might be the best powered gwas in the field for that um, trait or disorder of interest but once alex shows you where you can find the data in addition to walking you through some basic analyses he's also going to give you a little tour of the couple of tools that we use um, when we get a request from somebody about, um, well, I found this GWAS data set, here's what's in it, but I want X. And, and the idea here is to give you some strategies for how to get to X, uh, whether that's a gene-based test or determining whether you have some fun EQTLs there or replicating something you're seeing. So um, over to you, Alex, and thank you so much for doing this. Yeah, uh, no problem, Arpana. All right, I'm going to share my screen really quick and let's... Okay, and let's start at the beginning. Cool, look good to everyone. Looks right. good, Alex. Good. Cool, so if you're doing research that's not necessarily in human genetics, or not necessarily genome-wide association study research, this talk is really targeted to you to help you find the genes that you might be interested in. Um, so for example, we recently worked with the Williams lab and looking at some genes that they discovered in a mouse model of opioid use disorder. Um, and we were trying to determine whether the genes that they were interested in, how they ranked based on the total number of genes we discovered throughout the GWAS, right? And you can do this actually really easily using a series of online tools. Uh, you don't even need to do too much on the command line anymore. So the point of this talk is to kind of just demonstrate all of the resources that are available. So when you have a gene or a finding and you're interested in that, wh what can you do and what is available for you to answer those questions, right? And so as a roadmap, we're gonna start out by just talking about genome-wide association studies, particularly of substance use and use disorders, and give you some background on GWAS, assessing the summary statistics, and where do you find these summary statistics? Uh, next, we're going to talk about the bioinformatic approaches that we use with genome-wide association summary data, and really focus on these analyses you can do online and what these analyses mean, um, and how you can kind of make decisions and judgments about these online analyses. And finally, we're gonna to go to the whole genome level. And we're going to talk about things like genetic correlations and latent causal variable analysis and talk about how phenotypes relate to one another. So first, let's talk about the general field that GWAS comes from, which is the field of genetic epidemiology. Genetic epidemiology is interested in tracking diseases, but specifically as diseases relate to inherited variability in the genome. This includes broad families of studies like, you know, twin and family studies, which is what we were first trained on at the Institute for Behavioral Genetics and is now starting to include genome-wide association studies, which have been very fruitful, and even sequencing studies. Perhaps many of you saw the recent Nature paper that came out on schizophrenia this uh, last week or two weeks ago. And so an advantage of the genome-wide and sequencing technologies is that there's large-scale tools that that take these results and integrate them with what we know about biology and help us guide those biological findings into human populations. Now, of course, I am a researcher and an analyst for the Psychiatric Genomics Consortium, which means I focus on genome-wide association studies. And genome-wide association studies, for those that are unfamiliar, are essentially genetic searches where a linear model is run at genotype SNPs, and these typically are on an array or imputed based off the array. And we attempt to detect signal in various areas of the genome. Then once we have that signal, 
we integrate with bioinformatic tools to try and make meaning of that signal. Um, as a quick reminder for those that are familiar with GWAS, um, we also have to note that we are not looking at every variant in the genome. We're taking a sample of the genome in order to map our associations to it. And this includes about 7 million SNPs that are all common. The common variants also have relatively small effects. Um, this means that the effect sizes are so low that we need tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of individuals to find them, up to say a million individuals, which is where we're really starting to do some great work is at the level of a million. And over here to the right, you'll see that I have this effect size chart. And that's basically just recapitulating what I'm saying. Most of the common variants we study have these low effect sizes. And we haven't really found these rare, uh, rare variants of large effect sizes in substance use disorders. Now, in substance use disorders, there are a couple exceptions where we do have the relatively largest common variants of effects. And these typically either metabolize or bind specifically to a chemical, like for example, CHRNA5 is a nicotine receptor gene, right? And so we're, we're pretty special in our field in that we do have a couple of really nice examples. But there's also other genes in the genome that we're interested in because those genes, those metabolizing or binding effects are only a very small proportion of the variants explained. Okay, so now you're interested in genome-wide association studies and you're like, I wanna use a GWAS to look for my data. The first step is finding a trustworthy GWAS. Now, there's a couple things you can do. First, you can see if Hatoum is the first author. I'm just saying. No, I'm joking. Anyway, you can look for at the Manhattan plot and kind of diagnose what's going on with the GWAS and see if that GWAS is trustworthy, right? And so there's a couple of things to look for in the method section. First is you need to look for some sort of control for ancestry. This is typically uh, splitting into major geographic populations like African and European and then also using principal components ancestry as a covariate in that linear model, right? You also wanna look for controls for confounds like batch, or you can use things like ancestry tracks, which typically controls for many of these effects. Now, if you look over here, I have two examples of GWAS that did not use these covariates. On the top, we used no covariates, and all of these genes, these SNPs are highly significant. These log P values are impossibly high. Everything is significant. And this is an example of a bad GWAS, right? Because this one just isn't what we're expecting to look like. On the bottom, they did everything about the GWAS right, except for they didn't control for ancestry. And then they find essentially effects, again, all over the genome. Not every SNP is significant, but these effects don't look exactly good because there's no way to identify or tag in on genes. It's just the entire genome that's mapped to. And that's what happens when you're confounded by ancestry. Now, these are two GWAS that look relatively better. If you compare the log p-value on the top one, you'll see that it is much uh, smaller in magnitude and that there are a few peaks, right? And down here, um, the same GWAS, and once you've controlled for ancestor, you only have one or two hits that you can really uh, tag onto, but the results make a lot of sense. So when you're looking for a good GWAS, look at the Manhattan plot uh, and make sure that they controlled for these confounds. And if they have, then you're looking at one that's probably a stronger GWAS. Additionally, you probably want to look at GWAS completed by major research consortiums or major biopics. For substance use, I'm going to go through some of those now and tell you where exactly you can find them. First, um, what you need depends on kind of your question uh, as well. So uh, most of these analyses that I'm going to go through, such as gene, pathway, SNP-based results, you can tell them at the genome. Um, these are all things that we do with genome-wide summary statistics that you can do with any of the summary statistics I'm going to to present. Uh, you might require individual level data, and I do not have, I'm not going to give you access to individual level data where to find it. All these things up here, you can do with just summary statistics, with just the files that you will see today. Um, and luckily, GWAS researchers are very open to sharing summary statistics. Of course, you have the GWAS catalog, which is the easiest way to find genome-wide summary statistics. Uh, it's, of course, it contains a lot of different GWAS, not just substance use traits, but you'll have to look for your trait and look for your specific full summary statistic files. There's also the entire UK Biobank that's been available by the Neo Lab, but those phenotypes are not curated. And some of them might be very specific or weird phenotypes. Like there is one in there that's amount of cheese consumed, which if you're really interested in that, that's, that could be a cool question uh, for a lot of reasons, but that might not be specifically what you're interested in. You might be interested in say like fat consumed. But the, so the best source of data is then going to be from things like consortium web pages and using their readmes, which would be very helpful. 
And so this is an essentially an example of what a consortium web page might give you. Um, this is a GWAS I completed of executive functioning, and you'll essentially get a file that is very easy to upload into R, which includes the SNP ID, the effect allele, the minor allele frequency, the beta and the standard error. You'll also usually get some more information like the chromosome and the base position, which you will need for massive. But this is just essentially a very simple way to show you all you get is this data frame of association statistics. Okay, so the first major source of association statistics that you will get for substance use disorders is the Psychiatric Genomics Consortium, of which I am an analyst for, and ARPAN is one of the directors for. And these are typically genome-wide meta-analyses um, that focus on these disorders in particular, and we've completed uh, three as to date. So the first is the Walters et al. GWAS of alcohol use disorders, really focused on alcohol dependence. Uh, this is not the largest, I will go through the largest later, but it is very focused on alcohol dependence. The second is a cannabis use disorder GWAS that was completed by Emma Johnson, Thorgir Thorgerson, and Dee DeMontes. And this is probably the largest to date of cannabis use disorder that is publicly available. And then opioid use disorder can completed by Renato Palm Palmonati. And this GWAS, again, is not the largest. I will go through the largest later, but is useful because they looked at exposed versus unexposed controls. And so if you're interested in that process, these statistics will be great for your use. The next major source is the G-Scan Consortium, which looks more at substance use traits than substance use disorders, which allows them to get very large sample sizes. All of these phenotypes come from one study, this amazing Lou et al. 2019 study that was published in Nature Genetics. And this includes cigarettes per day, uh, drinks per week, ever smoking, smoking cessation, and age of smoking initiation. I will note that these phenotypes, while correlated with substance use disorders, are also separable, but they could be useful if you're interested in consumption and frequency of substance use or in initiation behaviors. Uh, finally, uh, a major source from another consortium is the International Cannabis Consortium. And to date, they have two major GWAS that are publicly available. And that is cannabis ever use, whether this person has ever used cannabis or not, those are the case and control definition, and the age of first cannabis use. Um, the cannabis ever use has about one hit, and the age of first cannabis use doesn't have any hits yet, but you can do some bioinformatic analyses with these and potentially discover a couple of genes that are associated with them. Next major source is a biobank. Uh, and this one, you have to be a PI to access or ask your PI for access. And this is the Million Veterans Program. And that's because DB, you have to apply through dbGaP to get it. And dbGaP requires um, evidence of a PI. These are, though, some of the largest GWAS of substance use disorders to date. And they include three major areas. And that's tobacco trajectories. So not just tobacco use disorder, but the trajectories of use alcohol use disorder, which was by Kranzler, and then there's another paper by Zhao. The Zhao is the largest, um, but the Kranzler includes multiple um, ancestral populations. And then opioid use disorder, which includes both uh, African-American and European, and is the largest GWAS of opioid use disorder to date. And so I ran through that pretty quickly. If you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. But those are where you're going to go to get your summary statistics. Those are the major sources of them in the substance use and use disorder field. Now we need to talk, though, about making sense of summary statistics. And making sense of summary statistics from a genetic epidemiologist standpoint almost always comes from the perspective of annotation, of annotating the results. So what does annotation mean? Well, genome annotation is marking information along each of those SNPs. But you're probably already familiar with a common form of digital annotation, which is Twitter. Hashtags are Twitter just telling you to annotate your own tweets for the amount of information. So the information you're essentially doing is hashtagging, uh, you're essentially hashtagging SNPs for this information. So you're hashtagging them for nearest gene, for their functional consequence, whether they're intronic, exonic, et cetera. Um, for things like enhancer promoter relationships, expression PTLs, and uh, even potentially other phenotypic associations, like you have a GWAS catalog of phenotypic associations, and you're curious what other trait is this SNP associated with, right? So really, this just comes down to Twitter for some reason, um, and I'll promote my own Twitter ha uh, hashtags later, but the point is, is that it's actually a very simple and straightforward way to get information from the genome. Now, when genome analysts annotate. We can annotate the genome ourselves in R or on the command line, but a lot of us as our first step 
end up using two online platforms. And those are FUMA, which is Functional Mapping and Annotation of Genome-Wide Association Studies website, and the Massive Pipeline. And these contain most of the analyses that you run post GWAS. Granted, there are always going to be analyses that you do in a GWAS paper that don't include what is on FUMA and Massive. But if you're not running your own GWAS and you want GWAS bioinformatics or summary statistics, everything you need is really contained in these two websites. And so I'm going to go through them as I go through the methodologies for annotating GWAS. And while I'm doing this, I'm going to have an illustration that we look at. And that illustration is the cigarettes per day GWAS from the Lew et al study. Um, and the reason I like this GWAS is because this is CHRNA5. And so it demonstrates a lot of the points we know about substance use disorders. Here's that specific binding receptor that's much larger than other effects. But we also have these, all these other effects that are incredibly important. Um, some of these are dopaminergic, um, others are other nicotine receptor genes. And so we have a lot of SNPs to work with. We have a lot we can play with here. And this is a very good looking Manhattan plot because we can see this map of the genome across the Manhattan plot. So now that I have introduced you to the concepts of functional annotation, I'm gonna introduce you to how we go about reading the evidence that we get from FUMA and Massive. So as a genomics analyst, I have to look at this data and try to make sense of it in order to, to make a publication, but also explain to other people doing genetics research, hey, this is where you need to dig. Look at this gene. Um, and so I kind of made a, a, a guide to showing you how to do that. And that's partially because FUMA can do a lot, right? All of these online platforms are going to do a lot and you don't wanna become overwhelmed with information. Right here, I have listed out all that FUMA can do. It can identify independent loci, map those loci to function, map them to genes via functional annotation, to EQTLs, it can filter those results for CAD, Regulome, and HI-C. And it can even do pathway enrichment with a lot of, a lot of us may be interested in integrating with our other data sets and even single cell enrichment. But I'm gonna focus specifically on things you can do in this tab here in FUMA, which is the SNP to gene, because that is the first place a GWAS analyst is going to look. I'm gonna look a little bit more in depth on when you go to SNP to gene, these tabs. And so in order to focus on that, I have created this pyramid of gene reporting certainty. This is, this is the analyst's hopes of getting a paper into a high impact journal. You have to fill out essentially one level of this pyramid in order to really talk about a gene in a sense that you think you've made a discovery. And that's kind of the logic. And so the top of that pyramid, what we're most interested in is, is there an independent exonic SNP that is an EQTL in relevant tissue? Now this is things like CHRNA5, and these are rare in genome-wide association studies, but they do happen and particularly happen in the substance use disorder literature. Next, if you don't have an independent exonic SNP that's an EQTL in relevant tissue, which very few of us do, um, then you're going to look at SNPs that are in high LD or linkage disequilibrium, highly correlated with the exonic variants, even if they aren't exonic. And those are also cis-EQTLs. And then finally, if there's not too many of those, you're going to say, well, maybe I don't have the best power, but I can increase my power by looking for things like gene-based associations, um, SNP enhancer promoter high c and Mendelian expression models, Mendelian or expression models. Most of these um, have more power, or analogs of them have more power to detect genes. So let's start with these methods because these are what's really available on FUMA. Uh, these are what really helps you leverage FUMA. And the first is gene-based associations. So on FUMA, the method for gene-based associations is MAGMA. All gene-based associations essentially combine the effects of all the SNPs on your gene to create a combined test for that gene. The way MAGMA does it is it takes all the SNPs that are positionally mapped to a gene, which we think are typically genes within 10 KB, or SNPs within 10 KB of that gene, and it combines them into one test then the model is competitive. Essentially, we don't look at whether they're associated as a combined model. We look at whether they're associated based on a random set of genes. Are they more associated than you would expect based on selecting genes at random or SNPs at random? Finally, we add, this is done in a regression format and the model is actually at the bottom of the slide. And the model controls for principal components and gene length. So we're not confounded by the most common issues in statistical genetics. And this can all be done 
with summary statistics. You don't need raw data. You can do it with raw data, but you can actually infer this regression model using a matrix of the SNP associations and their LD, which we typically use from thousand genomes. If your sample is European, then you'd use the European thousand genomes. If your sample is African, you'd use the African. On the website for FUMA and MAGMA, all of these different ancestral groups are actually available. Okay, so you have your gene-based associations, but now you're like, well, okay, most of my genes are either intronic or they have no known functional consequence. At this point, you might annotate them for information to see if they're SNP enhancer promoter relationships. And this is typically done using high c or almost always done in high c And so for those that are unfamiliar with the enhancer promoter relationship, we know that the genome is not existing in like a linear space, but exists within a 3D structure, right? And because it exists within a 3D structure, SNPs that are far away from each other can have regulatory effects that are typically far away from each other and linear structure can actually have regulatory effects and be much closer based on how they're wound around the histone. So based on information about that winding, you can see whether your SNPs actually have these long range regulatory elements. Um, there are several high C practicalities that are available in FUMA, and high C annotation can be run in FUMA. The essential way it's run there, though, is it's just an overlap between your SNP, so whether the SNPs that you have that are significantly genome wide, and whether those SNPs are annotated to a promoter enhancer element in the GWAS. This requires a pre existing data set of promoter enhancers, and high C has several, including the hippocampus, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. A, a ventricle and neural progenerators. And there's also builds for the adult cortex, the fetal cortex. And now, thankfully, the psych encode, which is an incredibly dense set, data set, has been made available on FUMA. So you do have a lot of information you can gain from high C. And there's a ton of these promoter enhancer relationships that come out from the high C approach. Now, if you're willing to go off the major websites like FUMA, there's also HMAGMA, which is a combined gene test and high C analysis which does a combined gene test like we just learned about with magma, but also includes SNPs that have long range regulatory effects with those genes of interest in the combined gene test. So this can give you a little bit more information than the gene-based test with a little bit more power and integrate these long range regulatory effects. And so here we have a surplus plot of chromosome 15 from cigarettes per day. And this is just to show you all of the long range regulatory annotations that come from one genome wide association hit that was here. So these are all potential long range regulatory connections that you could have based on this hit on chromosome 15. Okay, so now that we have gotten here, I'm actually just gonna go to FUMA. So I'm gonna stop sharing for now. And I'm gonna go to FUMA and I'm going to share the uh, actual screen that you would be working on. And this is the wrong one. Sorry about that. Keep showing the wrong one, so I'm going to exit out of it. I'm actually just going to keep going. And we'll look at that more at the end. OK. So that is the, the FUMA analysis. And the FUMA analysis is pretty simple to upload the data. You only need to know the names of your, your file, like headers, and it can be done easily. Uh, next is massive. So FUMA Alex, does almost Alex, everything. Alex, uh, just, just uh, convert to presentation mode. You're in your um, oh, standard. Yes. Sorry about that. So FUMA is, so, that was FUMA and this is massive. And so if you remember back to the triangle here, um, I've covered most areas of the triangle and most of them can be covered in FUMA. But these expression models, which are of interest to some individuals in particular doing research and pharmacological research, these have not yet been covered by FUMA. And for that, you need to jump over to Massive, which is a very similar online tool and will allow you to run certain analyses uh, that specifically work with these expression models. Right, so this is the landing site for uh, Massive. This is, of course, in beta still, but it is an excellent tool, and I recommend people use it. And we'll specifically be looking at, for that little last corner of the pyramid, the S multi X scan and the SMR analysis. And I'm going to explain what those are. 
but those are the tabs that you're going to be interested in under here, under analysis here, and then S multi X scan and SMR. And those are these Mendelian expression, Mendelian expression or imputed expression models. So first is these inferred transcriptional models. So inferred transcriptional models are essentially saying, hey, I don't have the transcriptome for my participants, but maybe I can impute what the transcriptome would look like based off my genome-wide association study summary statistics. And these models are essentially trained using either machine learning or Bayesian imputation. And when you run your GWAS, you can then infer what the expression patterns or differential expression patterns likely look like from genome-wide association studies results. These are built from EQTL datasets, such as the GTEx consortium datasets. And the reason why I like S multi X scan, which is available on Massive, is because you run each tissue separately and then do a combined meta analysis across tissues. And so, for those of us interested, for example, in brain tissue, you can run each brain region separately and then combine across brain regions in order to look at, you know, what is the combined brain expression versus expression in each individual tissue. Um, and so these approaches have become very powerful. And another advantage of them, which isn't exactly on the slide, is that they often are enriched for pharmacological signal. So for drug repurposing, this has been a direction that a lot of genome-wide association study researchers have gone. Now, they are not the only approach to looking at expression models. And in fact, there's a series of more complicated models that delve into the SNP by expression model a little bit more closely in order to estimate whether the SNP is causal for both the expression and the outcome of interest. And these are Mendelian randomization models. And so Mendelian randomization is often talked about in both the context of studying expression and phenotypes. Here, let's focus on the broad model and on the expression patterns. So a fundamental methodology um, for, use, for studying SNP effects is the process of using Mendelian randomization. It is, for those that are familiar with social genetics or for social statistics, is essentially just an instrumental variable analysis where genotype SNPs are used to randomize, randomize individuals to groups. And so over here to the right, I have a chart of the genome-wide SNPs and what they are. And over here to the, uh, and so each of these estimates, the Z is essentially your, your genotype SNP. X is essentially your exposure. And in our case, the exposure is always going to be your expression. Um, and Y is the outcome. U is some degree of unknown confounder, typically unknown confounder, that can also cause a relationship between X and Y. And we want the path from Z to X to Y over here to be the, the model that is the best fitting model. If either of these other models, either through U or through this three path here are the best fitting model. It is not the expression pattern and the outcome of interest is uh, not pleiotropic, but that doesn't mean changing the expression pattern will likely change the phenotype of interest. Um, so I will give a quick example of this in and, and, and much easier context, which is how it was first taught to me. And this is the concept of genetic causality essentially means that we establish a process where if a causes B, then the thing that causes A, P, also causes B. That is essentially the model we're interested in. And this is formally tested using the Mendelian randomization model within using SMR within the concept of both, uh, concept of both transcripts and epigenome methylation. But here, this is the first example that uses transcripts, and this is from the original paper that tested this process. And essentially, if you have what you suspect to be a causal variant, you have three possibilities. The causal variant causes the transcript, which causes the phenotype, that's what we want. They're both caused by pleiotropy or linkage. The causal variant and another variant are correlated and one predicts the phenotype and one predicts the transcript, right? And so the Mendelian randomization model is essentially testing that. So that is the, the logic of Mendelian randomization. And if we just do it within the context of like making a discovery with CHRNA5, we can ask is CHRNA5 relate the SNP relate to CHRNA5 expression? And does that predict smoking? Um, we can also expand this to a multivariate case, which is an advantage of Mendelian randomization. This essentially says that we're going to mul estimate multiple effect sizes, assuming that there's no effect or non-causality, and then test whether this mo model departs from causality. For those that are, again, familiar with the psychometric literature, think about it like you're just constraining all the SNPs to have the same effect, 
and you're testing whether or not that is true and whether that effect is the same between the two traits. Um, O'Connor and Price actually have a nice formulization of this, which is that you're essentially testing the marginal effect sizes compared to an expectation. And so for those that are less familiar with all the deep mathy literature, I actually have a really simple example that we can follow, which is just a, a three SNP example here, what would look like causality versus what would look like pre pleiotropy. So we have this example, which um, is going, which we're going to say is all three SNPs and they're causal. And that's because the marginal effect sizes, the pattern, the, the proportion of effect sizes are the same on of these these three SNPs on trait one and trait two, even though because of SNP one affects to twice the degree as SNPs two and three, right? However, this is more an example of pleiotropy. The SNPs are associated with both traits, but there's actually a different proportion of results, a different uh, pattern that we would get between the SNPs and the traits. So this is an example of what we would find as pleiotropy and therefore a non-causal model. Okay, so because of technical issues going to Google Chrome, I am not going to go to genoma.io. We can look at that again at the end, but for now, we're gonna keep moving forward. And additionally, there's more advantages to massive besides just filling out that last little box of the triangle. And that's because massive allows us to analyze phenotypes. And analyzing phenotypes is a big part of genetic epidemiology, epidemiology because we can determine what traits end up traveling together and for what reasons they travel together. So there's two basic models of genetic epidemiology that determine our overlap of traits. The first is genetic correlation, and the second is genetic causality. So we'll go back to that. We'll revisit genetic causality, but this time between phenotypes, and we'll kind of look at a multivariate version of that model. So first, genetic correlation. Uh, so this is perhaps the most ubiquitous method in the behavior genetics literature. I don't think you can graduate from the Institute for Behavioral Genetics without saying, RG somewhere in one of your papers. And this is as typically historically been estimated using the cross twin cross trait correlation covariances, but you can do this within more extended family designs as well. In GWAS, the SNP RG is simply a similarity metric between the effect sizes of two genome wide association traits, taking into account various levels of population difference. Uh, I'll, I will go into that more in a second, but this is essentially giving us the degree to which genes are shared between the two traits. For example, cannabis use disorder and opioid use disorder share about 70% of their genes, which suggests a lot of similarity at the genetic level. We can also look at traits where we can observe correlations phenotypically. I think one very interesting thing you can do is look at the correlation between cannabis ever smoking and cannabis use disorder and say, look, there about 50% of the genes of cannabis use disorder are shared with ever smoking, but that means the other half are also unique to cannabis use disorder. And so these are questions you ask with the genetic correlations with uh, LD score and with genetic correlations. And there are many methods you can use such as LD score, which is what we use particularly to estimate these two associations I talked about in GCTA. And I'm gonna talk about LD score regression because that is the method on massive. And that is the one that every GWAS analyst used that led to a revolution in genetic correlations. So LD score regression is a general method for estimating SNP heritability, heritability enrichment and co-inheritance. Um, we typically use it for genetic correlations, but it can do a lot more than just genetic correlations. The approach is essentially a regression of LD scores, which are just each SNP gets a score based on how many, how high LD it is with all the SNPs around it in a block. And we can include that in a regression model. Um, and we can do this in a multivariate sense, include a second line and get an estimate of the genetic correlation. What's important to take away from that is you get an estimate the proportion of shared genes between two traits by running that regression model. And because it is a very simple regression model done on the summary statistics, it takes 10 minutes at the most. This works incredibly well with summary statistics within major geographic ancestry groups. It does not work at all across major geographic ancestry groups because these LD scores are going to vary um, largely across those groups. And additionally, it only works really well on well-imputed variants where we can estimate those uh, associations and effect sizes with high precision. And you need a lot of SNPs to make this work. So a minimum 600,000, I wouldn't even like to run it at 600,000. I would say you want about a million SNPs in order to run an effective LD score regression estimate. So you're gonna be using the whole genome, not just the most significant SNPs. And so that is like getting the overlap, right? 
but we might also be interested in whether two traits are causal for one another, because just because traits share genes doesn't mean that they're necessarily pleiotropic associations. Now we may be interested in with like, okay, is this pleiotropy or causality? For example, we did a paper where we looked at COVID-19 and cannabis use disorder and determined whether it was pleiotropy that underlied the genetic association between cannabis use disorder and COVID-19, or whether there was a causal effect of cannabis use disorder and COVID-19 hospitalization, right? So these are the kinds of questions you answer with genetic causality, which we talked about previously in the Mendelian randomization sense. Now, the problem with Mendelian randomization, which you can also run a phenotypic associations on masses, but the problem with that analysis is that there are several assumptions that you have to take into account. With Mendelian randomization, you may be doing three to 30 or even 100 SNPs, but you are not looking at the entire genome. And this leads to several assumptions. First, you assume that there is no sample overlap. Second, that those SNPs that you have are effectively predictors of your trait. So when I say genetic instruments, that they are powerful, I'm saying that, okay, I can sufficiently predict the trait with the instruments that I have chosen from this model in order to make those model comparison segregations between traits. Um, this also means that the genes are likely not pleiotropic, although you can relax that assumption with most of the, the modern methods. So most of these assumptions, however, are violated in the case of substance use data, which is why I personally haven't used Mendelian randomization as much for substance use disorder data. We have published some with it, but I personally like this method, which was developed by O'Connor and Price in 2018, called latent causal variable analysis. This is run on Massive, and this takes the SNP RG that you had between two traits, and it partitions the variance into that into a causal process and a pleiotropic process. And so causality is implied. This is the line that I have to say when I present this method, when trait one is strongly correlated with the causal variable in the model compared to the second trait. And so that causal variable model is L. And the more correlated trait one is with that causal variable model, the more likely your trait is to be causal, right? That is expressed as a proportion. I will show you what that looks like in a second. And so it's actually a very easy to interpret statistic um, that makes very few assumptions and accounts for pleiotropy better than Mendelian randomization. And so this is what the data would look like under the assumptions of different, what we call GCPs. So this is a GCP, and this is the degree to which a trait is causal, genetically causal for the other, the genetic causality proportion. And in cases where there's no causality and the SNPs are associated, but they're orthogonal with the latent factor, then you would have a no causality. But as they become correlated with that latent factor, the same SNP effects can then have a causal association until they're perfectly genetically causal. And so if you look here uh, at this, this is essentially this is the exact output that is given to you by, um, I've just put it in parentheses, but that is given to you by mass, by uh, the LCV analysis, which is just GCV 0.75 and here's your p-value, which again, incredibly easy to interpret. You can get more information if you want it, but that's essentially what the model is doing. And because it uses, so, so there are advantages, so let me back up. There are advantages to the latent class model then to MR, which is in, in addition to its interpretability. Um, they're very similar approaches, but because of latent causal variable analysis is partitioning the genetic correlation estimated from LZ scores, it accounts for things like sample overlap and pleiotropy, and it can be partial. Whereas Mendelian randomization is like it's causal or it's not causal. Men MR does have advantages over latent causal variable analysis. MR can test bidirectional relationships, which LCV is just one direction or the other, or pleiotropy. Um, and M Mendelian randomization can work with raw genotypes and can work in smaller samples if you're interested in that. And LCV has low power when there is not a genetic correlation. So when you have a genetic correlation, use LC LCV. When you do not have a genetic correlation, MR is the preferred approach. Okay, now I was gonna jump to massive, but we're gonna fix that, the technical issues that I'm having before I go over there. I'm just gonna open up now to any particular questions that people have before I jump to those websites for examples. And I will click around those websites for a little bit. Hey, Alex, um, good so far, fast. Uh, I do have a, a general question. What is the relationship between the methods that you've been showing us and structural equation modeling or Bayesian network analysis? Yeah, so latent causal variable analysis is similar to structural equation modeling 
in that they both estimate the latent factor based on a pattern of associations. Um, but uh, it's, it's essentially estimating it based on the marginal effect size of the distribution. So rather than taking information from like an overlap matrix, like either the network approaches or structural equation modeling does, it takes the information based on a distribution of effects and then estimating the degree to which that distribution um, is uh, differentiates from an expected distribution, right? So with like a structural equation modeling, for example, you're asking whether a correlation, whether a matrix um, deviates from expectation. And with latent causal variable analysis, you're asking whether a distribution um, differentiates from expectation. Uh, so okay. that's the similarity between those methods. Mendelian randomization can actually be done in the context of a structural equation model. Um, okay. So Got it. I, but um, if you were to do Bayesian uh, network analysis, you would have the, the distribution uh, incorporated into the model, right? If you're making a prediction. Um, if you Bayesian network analysis, you're making like, uh, would you have the distribution incorporated into the model? You could incorporate the distribution. Yes, you could incorporate the distribution into the model. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's how we do it. Uh, we don't have latent variables, however. So maybe that's a difference there. Yeah, yeah, that, that could be the difference there. Yeah. I think okay. they would honestly derive to the same solution if you, uh, like, if you walk the path of the Bayesian network, but uh, we can talk about that more <laughs> later. Yeah. Just to any, any of you or many of you who are unfamiliar with, with some of the logic in this work that Alex has just presented, there is a really useful, good introduction with lots of genetics by Judea Pearl called The Book of Why. W-H-Y, and he goes through the, uh, the same example that Alex uh, highlighted, the, the CHRNA-5 example in smoking, which is a great example of why Fisher was reluctant to declare that smoking caused cancer because he posited the existence of a, of a gene variant just like uh, the cholinergic receptor that might actually contribute to cancer. And the uh, irony is that Fisher was actually right. That particular gene does modulate cancer susceptibility in addition to having a strong effect on smoking a desire. That's kind of an ironic case. Yeah, and that's also, I mean, that's a good reason to have, uh, to use methods like latent causal variable analysis too, because of pleiotropy and causality can be partial um, or there can, so, so you don't wanna estimate all or nothing, which is often done with Mendelian randomization. Um, but yeah, it's an interesting case, CHRNA5. But we also know that CHRNA5 is like likely causing cancer, a lot of lung cancer in particular via smoking cigarettes, like, for good reason. While you paused, um, Alex, there was one question from Kai Lim asking, um, could you just give a, a precy of what massive is again? <laughs> I, I guess, I, uh, Kai, the, the good news is we've recorded this so you can come back to this at any point. And we do have 30 minutes after Alex's talk. Alex, would you rather just hold back on that or? or... Um, I will answer that question after I go through FUMA because I'll just, I'm just gonna jump into Massive and click around for a second. Okay. Cool. All right, so let's start with FUMA. So FUMA and Massive are the two online pipelines that run bioinformatic analyses. FUMA is the one I'm going to start with, which is here. And so I've already uploaded cigarettes per day, and I'm going to show you those analyses, those, those levels of the pyramid that you might be interested in. So first, you always get your Manhattan plot, and this is a good looking Manhattan plot. And so this is one you'd wanna, you, you'd wanna continue looking at analyses for. You jump over here to results, and here's that page that I showed you where I highlighted the boxes. Okay, and so you have different information like lead SNPs, annotations, um, SNP annotations, for example, which gives you the nearest gene, right? That's something you might, in, you might be interested in. Uh, the position, which includes most of these downstream of a gene, intergenic, or uh, these are essentially functional consequences, exonic, intronic. And you can also filter by things like CAD and regulum score. But for those top things that you were most interested in the pyramid, whether they're an exonic SNP, and uh, it's, or a coding SNP, you're going to get that from this tab here on SNP annotations. Okay, so you don't have that. So you might be interested in whether they're exonic. Then if you don't have this, then you can jump over to other, other methods of uh, looking at the genome, such as the, if we go up here, 
such as high EQTL mapping, which is an optional response you have, or chromatin interaction mapping, right? And so I would recommend running these, but if you do run these, it's going to take potentially 24 hours for you to get back results. And so, yeah, so Laura has a question here. Does FUMA only consider protein coding or RNA? Uh, so Alex did, but let's see here. It, you can actually have the option to do more than just protein coding genes. It's actually a, it is an option around here somewhere where you can do a link RNA as well. Um, let's see here. So but even yeah. in that, that column of the table that you showed earlier, where mm -hmm. it was the nearest gene, does that, is that where you're changing it? Yeah, so no, that's, that's this is uh, this is just the results. So this is actually on running the job. So I did not, you can do that. I was trying to show you how you could do that on FUMA. I did not do that. I considered only protein coding variants when I ran this um, analysis here. Uh, but yes, FUMA can include non-protein coding elements of the genome as well. Alex, when you get a chance, perhaps maybe after we're done doing the tour of what you've generated, maybe it would be helpful to see what a new job page would look like, like where the stats would go and what buttons somebody may wish to activate to get some of these. Yeah, I, I can I can jump over to that um, actually uh, now, if people don't mind, that's fine, um, since we're already here. And so essentially, that it's pretty simple. Uh, you choose a file. And so the file would essentially just be like a summary statistic file. And then you tell what the headers of your file are. And all you need, this is very important. All you need really is the p-value, the effect size, and the effect and non-effect allele. That is the minimum you need to run this analysis. And that's all you actually need to run this analysis. All these other columns are, are unnecessary besides the SNP name, p-value, the, essentially these. These can add information, but they don't really actually help you on FUMA all that much. Then you'll answer some basic information about your GWAS and you'll, particularly which population your GWAS comes from. You can map all sorts of things based on FUMA um, and to all sorts of populations now, which is great, but that's where you start. And then you'll go into things like your positional mapping. So your positional mapping will run almost typically automatically, it's the default. And that is the, this is the functional consequence of the gene. Um, your scoring, if you want scoring or not, and how you want to filter those SNPs. And then, oh, here it is. Here's the gene types tab. And then you can also select things like EQTLs, selecting all of these data sets of EQTLs that you can choose from. I typically pick Common Mind, Brainiac, and the GTEx brain data because those are the ones that are relevant to the traits that I'm interested in. And you can also sort your EQTLs by all of these same filters. And same thing with high C. You select high C, and then you get the options for psyching code. Those are right at the top, but there's also several, such as neural progenitor cells, ventricle, that are also available here. And then there's gene types, depending on which type you're most interested in. Um, I also recommend uh, keeping this default of not of excluding the MHC for most of the analyses, particularly the gene-based test. And then of course there's enrichment and pathway analyses down here, but we didn't go through those today, but those are also possible to run. Cool, any particular questions there? All right, I'm gonna jump over to Massive. Um, so Massive has two onboarding sites, and this is one where if you run the Massive pipeline, you essentially get all of these different analyses. Now I'm going to focus on the analyses I said you can run in Massive which is genetic correlations, which are here, um, genetic causality proportions, and then these gene expression, DNA methylation, and multi-X scan. So we're really focused today on what you could run here. And so genetic correlations essentially gives you the output, and this runs 1,550 traits, several from multiple, from major consortiums, but also all of those traits from the UK Biobank. And you can see the degree to which your traits that you might be interested in, you can search for traits, this is cigarettes per day, by the way. So maybe we're interested in ever smoked. And that is the genetic correlation between smoking cigarettes per day and ever smoked. And that is the p-value, right? Age started smoking, if you're a former smoker. So a lot of interesting traits on here. You may also be interested in looking at the proteome, gene expression, or DNA methylation. And these are all done using the Mendelian randomization model. So this is the beta from that model. What you're most interested in is the PSMR value. 
And so these are the essentially the most significant um, likely causal proteins. And none of them actually pass genome-wide significance, although you can select other proteomes as well. And so all of these builds are actually already available for the most part in Massive and FUMA. Now, to be fair, uh, this methylation one, I know a lot of you are really into epigenetics. I have still yet to find a significant SMR methylation uh, association, but it's here if you're interested in that. And there are still significant um, proteins that we think are causally related, or expressions causally related to the trait of interest. Uh, finally, if you're really interested in neuro, well, neuroimaging, um, you have both the genetic causality proportions and the genetic correlation that are available. And so essentially whether this brain region, which is, you know, so if the left basal forebrain is genetically associated with and pleiotropic and has pleiotropic associations with the, uh, cigarettes per day, and the basal forebrain seems to be causal for the amount of cigarettes you smoke per day, although we have low power because there isn't a significant genetic correlation. And so all is available here along with several other pathway uh, tests that you can use. For this analysis, it can take up to a week. And so it's also beneficial to use um, an alternative, uh, an, if you're just interested in like one analysis. So if I go virtual lab, CTG, DL, you can run any of those analyses that I talked about just as an individual trait and it'll run in a matter of an hour or two. And so those are essentially the massive and uh, FUMA pipelines. Does anyone have any particular questions about those? Oh, so, so yeah, yeah, go for it. I just put one in the chat. That was why I use the SMR with the protein and the RNA instead of the LCV. Yeah, so an advantage, so Mendelian randomization also works with only a couple SNPs or like hundreds of SNPs. LCV requires the entire genome to have a significant effect. Um, they do, LCV is available for the, metabolome because that does have like whole genome signal on massive, but for RNA and proteome, you're more interested in the SNPs that are like closer to those genes, right? Uh, you might be interested in since they're farther away, but you're not interested in a million SNPs. You're potentially interested in up to hundreds, probably likely are in the realm of one to 10. So we tend to prefer Mendelian randomization for that analysis. Another question for you, Alex, is uh, are you able to actually generate as some, something as basic as a scatter plot or to change from uh, one court mode of correlation to another court correlation? For example, to rank order if you're concerned about low power or the distributional properties? Uh, no, for the, which I don't know what analyses you're talking about in particular, but the methodologies on the websites, they're typically whatever is considered most powerful for that estimate. And instead of um, allowing you to change the analysis, they just give you alternative metrics based on violations of assumptions. Um, you so, can do that type of analyses in MR base, which is another online tool I didn't go into where you can change those assumptions, but it works incredibly slow. Okay, but you so you can't even look at the distribution of the trait, the distribution of the trait, like phenotypic distribution or the distribution of yeah, effects? yeah, phenotypic distribution. Can you? No, because if they don't have that, they just have summary statistics on these websites. So you can't even. You would have to have the trait itself, that that raw data, in order to look at the phenotypic association or the phenotypic distribution or associations. Okay, so but we can assume then, as a community of users, that somebody has made very sure that there are no outliers or strange effects, or, you know, that, that makes me very uncomfortable, by the way, <laughs> to make that assumption. Yeah, so if it's a trait by the psychiatric, like one of the traits I talked about from one of the major consortiums, then yes, somebody has spent quite a lot of time looking through that phenotype, looking at what that GWAS is resulting in. If it is one of the UK Biobank traits, they have a kind of catch-all filter that they use in order to ensure their GWAS aren't compounded by those traits. And then it's that post-filtering, those are uploaded to these websites. Uh, so the, the general answer is there are precautions taken um, in the summary statistics in order to protect that. But you know, always the consortium data, if you're really interested in a trait, I'd use the consortium data because we know somebody's really carefully looking at those phenotypes. Great, thanks. Did you see you have another question in the chat? That's how to interpret results that differ 
for the same phenotype it's obtained from LCV and Mendelian randomization? Yes, that is a good question. And the way, so there's, there's two schools of thought here and my reviewers only entrench me more in mine, which is I typically go with the latent causal variable model, um, but that's not actually the correct way to go about it. The way you should go about it is to test the assumptions of Mendelian randomization and see if those assumptions are violated. Um, so for, so, so for the SMR approach, they do have estimates like the Heidi outlier, which is a degree to which there's pleiotropy and therefore violations. Most methods will, will output violations of, of those assumptions, like what is the p-value for those? And then you'll be like, okay, assumption violated, I should trust the latent causal variable model over the other approach. The other thing I would always check is the weak instrument problem. Is Mendelian randomization, are the SNPs that you have really strong enough to make the segregation? in between phenotypes that you want. If they are, then you're fine. Um, then, well, then you're fine using Mendelian randomization, but typically when LCV and Mendelian randomization differ, that's the problem. Uh, it's either pleiotropy or because of the weak instrument problem. And you'll typically have an estimate of pleiotropy uh, that comes from one of these programs. Did that get your question answered, Salvatore? I can assume yes. Yeah. Arpana seems to have her hand raised. Yeah, um, I, I just wanted to go back just for a moment to Rob's earlier question about data distributions. Um, I, I don't think that's a negligible concern. And as a consortium representative, I will say that we don't we don't presume that we always make the right decisions. Everybody, you know, uses a continuous trade in some cases, and the cutoffs vary. So, if that's the type of analysis you would like to do, where you'd like to look at the phenotype, we absolutely recommend you access the raw data. Um, it's you know we're almost forbidden from reverse engineering anything from the summary statistics. So, mm -hmm. um, th that is something that is actively discouraged. Um, there are not so hard ways of accessing the raw data or individual level data. As Alex has pointed out, we didn't go into it because we wanted to show you what you could do very quickly on your desktop with mm -hmm. what's available. And indeed, Alex has a GWAS that's under review, under revision to using summary statistics to create a new GWAS of a new phenotype. So you can do that with genomic SEM and with asset. Um, thanks, Alex. Um, shameless self-promotion, um, but the, so we can these days with summary statistics, as long as we're making sure the distributions look okay. Um, and we go back and forth. I know Alex had long conversations with the developers of GSEM to make sure that the assumptions that went into each of the parent GWASs were sufficient to allow them to go into the st structural equation model. So we can do that, but we couldn't go back, for instance, and check if the distribution of, uh, oh, I'll pick on one of our phenotypes, uh, the cannabis use disorder GWAS, whether decodes definition of cannabis use disorder and ISEC's definition of cannabis use disorder are convergent. And we ran genetic correlations, so we know they're genetically similar. Um, dbGaP is an outstanding resource for individual level data. If you go into a GWAS and you feel like you actually want the individual level data, um, if it's with the PGC, you can submit a secondary proposal to us and it goes through our group and you can then access the individual level genotypic and phenotypic data. You have to work on the server that the NIMH and NIDA authorize us to store data on, this GDPR, so it's not something we govern. Um, but you can do that. If it's MVP, that wouldn't be us. You'd have to reach out to them. Likewise, 23andMe, possibly not going to happen. But um, absolutely, there are ways to access the individual level data. And, and Rob asked me to actually post. He wanted me to post that link eventually during the discussion. That's why it was so so ready. Arpana gave me a good opportunity. And that's a, if you were interested, that's a paper where I use FUMA Massive and then analyses that expand on what I've talked about today. Um, and a genome-wide association study. And that study was done entirely um, with summary statistics, going from genetic correlations to estimating a GWAS, and then taking those GWAS summary statistics and doing a series of analyses with them. So you can combine summary statistics into much larger samples and to answer interesting theoretical questions. Uh, and that paper is an example of that and how we did that to create a sample of a million individuals to study a broad addiction vulnerability.
Great. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Alex. Uh, this has been a great presentation, and Arpana, thanks for uh, that that uh, comment. Also, uh, it's time now to to open. I think you're you're done, right, Alex? Yes, I'm completely done. Okay. So please uh, engage in discussion because um, there are a lot of you here, a lot of experts that I see. I see Emma. I see Carl. I see a lot of people who are uh, much more competent than I am in in these areas. So. Uh, we and might there's as well one, ping Alex. Pretend there's one more calls again. <laughs> there's one more question in the chat too. Nainad, it, would you like to ask that one if you want to unmute yourself and ask it in a little more detail? Oh, I think uh, maybe so, he's so the, logged off. The, I oh. can I can read it out loud. Um, so. There are stem related thresholds for MR versus LV. Are there any genetic correlation related thresholds to choose one approach over the other? Um, I would say that in terms of the genetic correlation, if you can estimate the genetic correlation reliably, reliably so it's uh, significant and probably above like 0.05, you're probably fine to use LCV. Honestly, you can use LCV even when the genetic correlation is zero, it's just not as well powered. Um, so, but as long as you have a significant genetic correlation, I say LCV would be the preferred approach for looking at the overlap between two traits personally. Are FUMA and uh, the and all, all the tools, are they on the um, most recent human genome assembly? Do you, can you swap from one assembly to another fairly easily or is that a major motion picture at this point? Major motion picker at this point. Um, massive, no. Um, Fuma might have it, but I've never, I've never chosen those options. Uh, always, always go with Build Thirty Seven, HG Nineteen. Those are the ones that I, I'm familiar with. Um, I know Liftover is the tool that people use when they want to switch, when they want to roll back the genome, and I'm. So that is that is kind of where we are. Yeah. I apologize to anyone that put a lot of work into creating new genome builds that might be on this call, but that's where a lot of these tools are. <laughs> uh, and, and get ready for uh, a big transition to pan genomes, folks. That's going to get a, a lot more interesting and maybe ugly for a few years. And we need it, though. Like, I've done a lot of this. Uh, that paper, the one that I put in the link, has a lot of uh, multi, multi ancestry GWAS in the supplement. And we, we sorely need better alignment of um, non-European GWAS. We, severe, we sorely need more non-European GWAS too, uh, particularly for substance use disorders and behavior, but we're the best at it. We're close to the best at it in the PGC for, <laughs> I think we're the best. We have a lot of African-American samples, a lot more than others, partially because of the MVP. And I'm still, we're both, we're, we're monitoring the, uh, the chat. So please chat away. Um, in the absence of chat, I will chatter, <laughs> which seems to be my function. The old guy that chatters. <laughs> I was wondering for Alex and for the group, from the things that Alex has shown you, and for you, Alex, yourself, and being a user and others, is there something you'd like to see added? Not that I can, <laughs> I'm not here on behalf of Danielle Postuma to, to add things, but what do you think is missing that might be worthwhile in the future? Um, to integrate into this or have as an additional resource? Mm -hmm. Well, first I'll say it's a fabulous resource. I can remember hearing about it first at one of our NIDA meetings where everybody was talking about FUMA. I was going, what the heck is this thing? <laughs> Maybe it was you. Uh, so, so thank you for highlighting it. Uh, I think it's, it's worth, to, to those of you who don't know the history of this, FUMA was created by one graduate student, at least that's my understanding, over about a three year period. And unfortunately she uh, was recruited into industry, I believe. Is that true roughly Arpana or, or what's the current development status of FUMA? Do you know Alex? If yeah, Kyoto Yeah, Alex Lab maintains it still. Um, so it was Kyoko Watanbe in, um, in Daniela Posthuma's lab. She developed it pretty much single-handedly, although a lot of the methods in it are developed by other members of Daniel Posthuma's lab, particularly Magma. And um, yeah, and Kyoko got recruited to Regeneron to help them develop their online tool for genomics. Um, she's a very skilled bioinformatician. Um, oh, she's at Regeneron now? She's at Regeneron now, yeah. Last I heard. 
which was about six months ago. Ah, okay, so it, Regeneron in uh, New Jersey, right? So she is, she's in the States. Well, I think it's in Terrytown, but yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah, okay. Terrific, uh, uh, we're, we've just started collaborating with Regeneron. We have 10,000 pediatric samples uh, from them and uh, we, we could use some, some help. Uh, and so just knowing that she's there at Regeneron is, is a boon. Thanks. Yeah, Vera's also at Regeneron. So he's, there's a lot of good former PGC analysts at, at Regeneron. Yeah. <laughs> we've, been dang, we've been dangling the pan genome in front of them. Eric Garrison and his uh, significant other Enza Colonna try, trying to get them to fund that. Uh, they, they haven't bitten yet, but we're working with Tom Kern and the group at, at Mercy Children's who have about 250 hi-fi uh, sequence data sets up to 30X for humans. So unfortunately they only have about 5% African-American. So we're a little bit thin there, but. There, there is another question in the chat from Michael. I think this is a good ARPANA question. Um. Is it possible to collab? This is a great question. Um, it it is one of the priorities, at least within I'll speak for our consortium, the Psychiatric Genomics Consortium. This is a priority area for us, is to connect with investigators in other countries and see what their needs are so that they can begin to collect data and establish these repositories. Um, so it really depends on the countries in which you would like to work in or data from. Um, the way these partnerships work, at least within the PGC, is that we have PGC colleagues who have contacts and then they reach out and they work with the PIs and figure out ways to get funding. So it really depends on what part of the world you'd like to access data from and who the investigators, the cast of characters there would be and whether they're you know, already engaged in research or need help with getting grants written or whether they can help us with understanding the phenotypes and the methodologies, definitely you know, lots of crosstalk. Um, but if you're interested in a, spe in a specific um, topic and a specific region, uh, you know, reach out anytime and we'll, if, we'll probably not, we're not gonna know the answer right away, but we can connect you at least to people doing research in Latin America, Africa, and East Asia, and then a little bit in South Asia. Those are the countries where we have collaborators and colleagues who are trying to you know, increase data collection for a variety of psychiatrically relevant traits. Even within the United States, I think our minoritized populations are not well represented in our data. Um, and that's something that is, is not as readily addressed by national initiatives because there's a reasonable amount of disparity in who enters the healthcare system, who can access it, who can avail of it. And, and so we're, those pop, uh, not all of our populations are truly population representative. That's, that's for sure. Let me, let me just second that with a little story I learned yesterday, a couple, well, last week talking with uh, the group at Mercy Children's. They thought they had sort of a shotgun random uh, assortment of kids that entered the hospital system with strong indications of genetic diseases that needed to be diagnosed quickly by sequencing. Um, their population is 15% African-American. The actual number of African-American kids that were brought into the clinic, 5%. That's a threefold loss even before they get into the, to the, to the system. So if, if you think, so the, you know, obviously there's a lot of ancestry bias in genomics still, although we're all acutely aware of it. That's not where the serious problem is, folks. The serious problem is way before that stage. I think I have a question both for Alex and Arpana about, um, about admixture mapping as a potentially way superior way to do GWAS because the linkage blocks are so humongous. So um, I guess it would be great to have one of you briefly mention what the heck admixture mapping could be and how African-American populations or any ad admix population with a lot of LD that's not only within a chromosome but across chromosomes can be exploited to for very high power mapping 
but low precision, more like a mouse or a rat population. So I, I don't have an icon that says he's going to answer the question, but this is, <laughs> Alex is passionate about this topic. So go for it, Alex. Yeah, so I, I'm actually going to be speaking on this, at this at NIDA um, in a couple, in two weeks. Um, I'm talking about more multi-ancestral genomes. In terms of admixture, the most popular approach does not go across chromosomes, looks within a chromosome, and it even goes a little deeper and it looks at tracks within chromosomes. So you're looking at tracks of ancestral similarity. Uh, the approach is called tractor for that similar, for that reason. And using the tracks of ancestral similarity, you can include um, all sorts of different populations and analyze them simultaneously. And uh, the model essentially has like a different beta estimate based on the population. And so you can get estimates that are population general, which combined information, but that are also population specific which gives you a higher sample size because you're comparing across individuals, but also um, gives you the effect size for that population, right? So you can leverage all of your sample and the, the differences in them and get, uh, estimate several parameters. And that's the, most, that's the most popular approach right now that does require raw data. Uh, so if you wanna do some sort of something, anything with an admixture population and leverage that admixture, um, then that is the way to go forward right now is with Tractor. Uh, I, I in, again, very specific to within each chromosome. I'm not as familiar with methods that work right now between chromosomes. And then with summary statistics, you can't really look at admixed populations uh, too effectively across um, some, using summary statistics, but principal components within a major geographic ancestry group that is admixed do do a pretty good job. And then you can co-analyze those with other samples using a series of different models. Um, so, for example, I meta-analyzed African American populations with Europeans after very strict control in the African American sample, and then I used models that modeled LD from a similar population to combine the two. Uh, so, MAMA is a good one, which is coming out now that I'm beta testing for the Broad. Um, but there's also MR Mega, and then um, a really simple approach that has really low false discovery rate is just a random effect for each ancestry group. But that does require splitting up the genome. And so people that are very admixed, you are, are unfortunately been left out of most GWAS to date. So do these methods use a hierarchical admixture model? Uh, no. Okay. So what, what I'm talking about there, if, if, if it, you know, just so everybody is sort of on, on board, um, if you have an African American population, then there's admixture from West Eurasians, which will be very common, of course. Uh, then the question is, if you have that West Eurasian haplotype block, can you recognize whether it's Scottish, Irish, whatever, uh, Italian, et cetera? And so there, there's sort of a different level of precision. But Alex, coming back to your the very start of your presentation, you mentioned it's nice to have a million or more. And if you're doing admixture mapping, so we have about 5,000 African-American kids would that Regeneron has genotyped and sequenced for us. So should, what kind of sample size can you get away with to do re relatively decent admixture mapping? Um, so are you talking about doing this in the context of finding genes associated with the phenotype or are you just talking about uh, sort like, what is your exact outcome that you're looking at for the map? Okay, so let me let me make make it real. So let's say that we've got in the future. Let's pretend we have um, twenty thousand kids, all African American, at least self declared, and of those twenty thousand kids, two thousand have various forms of seizure epilepsies. Mm -hmm. Would would there be any prospect for mapping a locus, not a gene, but a locus, and then just looking up what the likely candidate gene was? from other GWASs? Uh, yeah, yeah, no, we, that would be pretty, yeah, you could do that. Um, in 20,000 individuals, I think Tractor would be okay. I think Tractor can work well in 6,000, uh, maybe even fewer individuals, but it depends on the genetic architecture of the trait. Um, and the, the genetic architecture of the trait when you are when you have sequence data can is going to vary within LD score bins, and those bins are going to vary across ancestral groups. So. I know the, the classic academic answer is it depends, but it's really, if you have a really high variant of large effects that only influences African-Americans, you'll discover it in that, your sample of 5,000. And I'm thinking of an example, and it, it also depends on the trait in that 
let's say you're looking at African Americans, you have 5,000 people. If you're looking at a metabolite, something from the blood, 5,000 might be enough. There's a really good example of this from the diabetes group. It's an excellent paper where they use GWAS, not even sequence, and found uh, African American specific effects in a smaller sample. And that's because this effect is relatively large in that sample. It's in plus medicine, um, H1ABC, GWAS, and African Americans in plus medicine, and you'll find it there. Um, so, so yeah, so is 5,000 enough? Maybe, especially if you're looking at a metabolite, especially if there's a gene of high effect. If there isn't, no, <laughs> do, a do a larger sample, always larger. I looked at substance use disorders in 80,000 African Americans and what well, from 10,000 and scaling up to 80,000 and at about 20,000 for alcohol use disorder, I find one SNP and that is it until you get to about 86,000 and then you only find one other SNP and I think it's being driven by alcohol use disorder. So, you know, for substance use disorders, I wouldn't say you're gonna find much at 5,000. Okay, thanks, appreciate it. Ah. Yeah, so there are differences though between you, know, GWAS and Admixture. Highly recommend the tractor package for anyone interested. Um, right. If you're interested in multi ancestry analyses, there should be a suite of tools coming out sometime in the next year to pay attention to. Great. I think I'll set up a meeting between you and Enza Colonna, who's a population geneticist here, who's, who's uh, getting started. Well, she's done an admixture mapping. Um, she's part of the pan genome team. You know, she's because, as I mentioned, she's um, with Eric in Italy, and they'll be coming to Memphis in uh, August. So it'd be be fun to actually drive up to Wash U and and chat with you. You you both. You are welcome to. Um, I'll take yeah. you. Yeah, I I live in the uh, the greenhouse um, garden district, so. Welcome to okay. come by and see all the plants. Good. Maybe, maybe we can all do a, a tour to Kansas City, which I gather is in Missouri somewhere, <laughs> mm -hmm. and and see what they're doing for long read sequencing at uh, at uh, Mercy. Yeah. Have you have you either of you visited there? Uh, visited Kansas City or the people there? Or uh, uh, Mercy Children's. I haven't been so, there. Anymore. So, so Tom Curran got a, a huge amount of money and built a, a new genomic center. And it's, it's got the structure. If you look at it, it's an old, it's been lit up with LEDs that make it look like an old school um, uh, slab electrophoresis uh, uh, genotyping. <laughs> it's pretty funny. <laughs> I'll check it out. I think we. Uh... Maybe we can continue these conversations on our own though. I feel like uh, if there's any last questions, feel free to ask them. I've also put my uh, name, uh, my email and my Twitter in the chat. So thanks everyone for listening. Thanks for coming and sticking with us this long. And yeah, I hope you're able to use these GOS tools for yourself. If you're willing to take another couple minutes, I'd love to hear kind of what's the next big thing. So um, within this, within this, within the the context of substance use disorder GWASs, is is the the route forward bigger sample sizes, more diverse populations, or are there other technologies or other approaches that are you're thinking? It's kind of the next frontier. Um, I'm going to give you three frontiers. The first is the one we've been talking about which is integration of multiple ancestral populations. Uh, that will exponentially increase our sample size. A sample size of 80,000 80, African Americans is worth more than you know, another 100,000 European Americans. And it's probably even scales better than that. Um, second is always going to be multi-omics integration, but I think we're really gonna start seeing more integration with things that are relevant to pharmacology. Um, so there was a, a protein-wide association study that was published today on psychiatric disorders on PTSD or this week on PTSD. That was really good. Um, and we're going to continue to use that. Uh, I use the LINCS data set, which integrates with perturbogens. And we're going to more probably integrate with those types of data sets, PubChem. That's not really done too much because of um, these issues with LD. But as we use ancestry to estimate the causal genes, we'll be using those more. And the third thing is stratifying patient populations. There's definitely heterogeneity in our statistics. And as our sample sizes get large enough, we can also estimate what the subpopulations are in our data, either by doing it with the raw genotypes, which 
historically hasn't worked all that well, or by integrating in other phenotypes like imaging phenotypes or more deep um, like substance use behavioral phenotypes. So, so when you say stratifying, you're ta you're talking about their their the heterogeneity in this definition of an opioid use disorder, or the heterogeneity in an alcohol use disorder. Stratifying them based on those kind of outcomes, or what's yeah. I, so one way that I've stratified patients is because if I'm also a neuroimaging researcher, is I stratify them based on brain wide associations and split people into like this type of AUD versus this type of AUD right, based on the, the differences in their brain. Um, and so that's one way, uh, and you can use that, in, and then you can combine that with your large GWAS samples to create very large, um, that plus GSEM equals a very large GWAS of a very specific subtype of alcohol use disorder. And then combining that with multiomics, you get drug repurposing, right? Um, combining that with minority populations, you get more power. So it's all about power, it's all about discovery, but the discovery is going to be improved by minority populations, multiomics, and reductions in heterogeneity. So to con continue on that, uh, Laura's question, which is great, you know, those these are the big questions. Um, the neuroimaging you, you mentioned, Alex, so the Human Connectome Project obviously is right there in your backyard mm -hmm. with David Van Essen. Um, it was an amazing, uh, uh, aggregation of monozygotic and dizygotic twins and, and other family members. Um, it's not huge, but it had family structure, which makes it quite powerful. I don't know that it ever got sequenced or genotyped properly. I It did? Okay. It is genotyped and you can get mm -hmm. it out of dbGaP. Um, it, yeah, so the HCP1, the, the 21 to 35 year old cohort that initially David set up is genotyped. Um, it does actually have a fairly detailed assessment of substance use disorders, but what's in the NDA is a much more restricted set. We actually clean those data at our office. So um, they're certainly available. I'm not sure, and Alex, you may know if HCP development and HCP aging that are on either side, that's the five to 21 and the 36 to 100 plus that are smaller, I don't think they're twins. Um, whether they have GWAS data, they might. Are and is there, is, are there some higher profile papers on that? The genetics? Of the HCP data, Alex, do you know, we never played, um, we played with the twin data, but not. Not the, the I mean, Arpana, you have a PRS paper using the genetics. I, I, I haven't used the, I've used the family structure um, and mm -hmm. there's a whole, whole pro, high profile paper in cerebral cortex on the, using the family structure for the genetics of the connectome we mapped very closely the heritability across the whole connectome at the lowest levels possible. Yep. Um, and that used HCP in another large sample of a longitudinal twin study at Colorado. That's about the same size as the HCP um, as discovery and replication samples. Um, but yeah, the, when people do the statistical genetics on the imaging stuff is all UK Biobank, ABCD. Mm -hmm. And th there might be HCP papers where the PRS were pulled in. Um, we ran into a structural barrier, which is once the data were deposited to dbGaP, and this is wonderful for all of us, they're completely de-identified even from us. And the phenotypes we wanted are in-house. So we're actually not allowed <laughs> to link those. Um, but we're, since then, we've thought of ways around that. That was early days. And, and as Alex said, um, if you're looking for twins and sibs, um, and you don't mind that they're unexposed. ABCD is phenomenal. We've got what, 800 pairs across Missouri, Colorado, Virginia, and Minnesota designed by twin geneticists, um, really with the emphasis of making sure that while ABCD itself is a school-based, they had a very nice design for how they recruited ABCD. These are twin, these are recruited using population-based cohorts of twins. So it's, it's a nice design. Great. I'll have to look at that. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. And anybody so, can access the data. You just go get an account on NDA, get IRB approval, and you're good to go. Yeah. And in terms of GWAS summary statistics for those, they're all on massive, all the brain regions that have been run in UK Biobank, Enigma, which is a multi GWAS meta-analysis for imaging um, are all on massive if you want to try them out. That left basal forebrain, for example, that's from UK Biobank. And likewise, I think for ABCD, there's Mike Neal and Hermine Maz are um, revising a manuscript that's going to come with an app where you can look mm -hmm. at the heritabilities of things. 
So it's been a great place for methods development. And I should add that if you're ever considering uh, to the small group here, that if you're ever considering machine learning, that is another of Alex's secret identities in that he is <laughs> very committed to the proper use of machine learning when integrating genomics and neuroscience. Yes, particularly to protect minority populations from algorithmic bias. It, it ties into everything I've talked about already. It's not like this isn't all weird, just nebulous stuff. Everything I've talked about does have a central, you know, we're trying to we're trying to find discovery and find the right things, increase power, reduce heterogeneity, find the right things. That's all that I'm interested in. 